Mr. Hawk uh, is, uh, is, is now retired and is now tied up with something which is very interesting and very uh, close to uh, the conference actually, and that is, um, is with Daily Prathamalo, the advisor research and archives. And I understand that he's, he's working on the military history of Bengalis and war of independence. And I was uh, telling Mafidul Bhai whether we could have a subaltern uh, war memorial uh, here in Dhaka on, on World War I um, and not necessarily, you know, the British, which I, uh, which I heard that it was demolished. It was there, uh, uh, but it's no longer there now. Uh, Mr. Hawk is going to speak on Bengali volunteers of Chandnagar in the French army. Please, Mr. Hawk, 20 minutes? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Thank you. Formerly, it was known as Chandar Nagar. It is a small township situated 30 kilometers north of Kolkata on the bank of River Hooghly. Total area of Chandanagar is approximately 19 square kilometer. In 1916, Chandanagar had 21,000 inhabitants, out of which 11,000 inhabitants were from outside Chandanagar from different parts of British India. In 1916, it was a French enclave within British India Mr. C. Vincent was the administrator and Mr. M. Jogendranath Mukhopadhyay was the mayor of Chandanagar. France had few more enclaves in British India, namely Pondicherry, Karikal, Yanon, Mahe. Pondicherry was the capital of French India. These French colonies, colonial towns used to be governed by French law. Mr. M. A. Martinu was the governor of French India in 1916. Some 25 years before the First World War, a rumor is spread in Chandranagar that conscription will be enforced in French India soon. People became panicked. Young men along with their guardians were afraid of losing their life and religion, both due to the conscription. When the fear of conscription was at its peak in Chandranagar, the French governor from Pondicherry came to Chandranagar for an official tour. A grand reception was arranged at the residence of Mr. Durgacharan Rokhit. All senior and respected citizens of Chandranagar were present in the reception party. Senior citizens took the opportunity and humbly appealed to the governor, O oh, our Lord, we are Bengalis. We give them to fighting, scuffle, bloodshed. If conscription is imposed on us, then probably we will have no other option but to abandon Chandranagar. Please promise us that this rule will not be applicable for us. We are happily staying under the French flag. Please rescue us from any disaster." Unquote. Governor said nothing in reply, but for some reason the conscription was not introduced in French India. Above his story relates to Chandranagar, but it equally applies to the Bengalis of other parts of India. History doesn't support that the military service was ever a priority profession for Bengalis. Neither rulers of this land preferred Bengalis at, as professional soldiers. This is the reason why we find no army composed of Bengalis in the history. Opportunity came for Bengalis to join army when almost the whole world got involved in World War I in 1914. England and France were the two main actors of World War I. Need of manpower could not meet by them from their own soil. In the natural course, rulers made recruitment open to their colonies to meet the first reinforcement requirement from the battlefield. First group of Bengali soldiers from Kolkata reached Mesopotamia in July 1915 to provide medical service, which Rana China has narrated a bit. This group of volunteers was known as Bengal Ambulance Corps. 
They continued their service as non-combatant till August 1916. Next opportunity for Bengalis came from French government. This time it was as combatant soldiers. My presentation will give you some detail of these combatant soldiers who joined French army in First World War. At the outset, I must admit that I find no government or military documents anywhere on Chandanagar volunteers. All my information and pictures are collected from the old newspapers and memoirs. However, French government decided to enroll soldiers from French India at the end of 1915. President Mr. Poncier declared recruitment open for Indians on 30th December 1915. Presidential order is stated that the Hindu Muslim citizens of French India will be recruited as soldiers in the army till the war ends. Recruited soldiers will serve French or native army depending upon the requirement and situation. The governor of French India published the presidential order on 29th January 1916. An appeal with details on recruitment was circulated by governor to all offices, courts, and educational institutions, etc., on 7th February. Governor appeal said that India is indebted to France in many ways. It is now duty for every Indian to stand beside France during this hour of adversity. It will be treated as seen if the responsibility is not discharged properly. On the other hand, France will never forget these who will come forward in her hard days. France will accommodate them beside her own son. Therefore, please join French army in large. No clear indication was given by the governor about the privileges and his status of the colonial citizens in French army. In later days, it was circulated through newspaper that France will enlist the volunteers on the same pay and status as Frenchmen and promised French citizenship after the war. A citizen committee was formed, uh, headed by the administrator of Chandanagar, to organize the volunteer group. Elder citizens like Charuchandra Roy, Horihara Shet, Motilal Roy, Tinkori Boshu, Monindra Nayak, Ruplal Nandi, and few others were the members of the citizen committee. Main function of the committee was to motivate the young people to join army. The committee also helped in recruitment and raising funds for the comfort of the Bengali recruits and provide incentive to the families of the recruits if needed. Siddheshwar Mullik and Narendranath Sarkar from Chandranagar responded to the call of French government and applied to administrator for enlistment. Mullik was a student of intermediate class. Sarkar was little aged and having three children and a wife in his family. Haradhan Bokshi joined soon the, with the team and took leading role in, in enlistment, uh, more people for the French army. These early volunteers conducted series of informal meetings in the town to motivate young people to join army. At the end of February, a large meeting was arranged by the early volunteers at Boroi Chanditala sporting ground. 18 young men came forward to join army. Haradhan Bokshi sent a letter narrating the success of the meeting to Chief of the Military Bureau at Pondicherry. Haradhan Bokshi received the following reply from the Military Chief, quote, Dear Sir, I have the honor to welcome your letter of the 4th of March, in which you have been kind enough to inform me that, in concert with several Bengali citizens of Chandanagar, you held in your town a meeting with the patriotic object of having recruits for the French army from the non renewant Hindu. I myself am very happy to congratulate you on the initiative you took in these circumstances. And I hope your effort will be crowned with success. Chandanagar will show its sense of duty towards France by sending men to defend her." Unquote. On 6 March, a meeting was organized by the citizen committee with the administrator in chair. Administrator, mayor, and other speakers addressed the audience. In pursuance of the early volunteers and with the support from the citizen committee, motivational program continued throughout March. 
By the end of March, total 75 young men applied for enlistment, including the three mentioned earlier. 12 applicants withdrew their applications later. Rest 63 applicants were called for the medical examination. 36 applicants remain absent in the medical examination. 27 appeared for medical examination, out of which 20 were selected. Selected volunteers were within the age of 16 to 30. Balai Chandranath was only 16 when the Narendranath Sharkar was 30. On 10th April, Citizen Committee decided Motilal Roy as the representative of the volunteers for all official purposes. On 11th April, Haradhan Bokshi was made leader of the team of the volunteers. On 11th April, it was circulated through newspaper that the first batch of volunteers will leave Chandanagar on 16th April for training at Pondicherry. Originally, the date of departure was fixed on 14th April, but was changed to 16 on the ground of the former date being inauspicious according to the Hindu calendar. Their train will leave Chandanagar at 5.43 p.m. and reach Howrah at 7.12 p.m. And from there, volunteers will leave for Pondicherry at 8.30 p.m. Volunteers were treated with a farewell dinner by Motilal Roy on 15th night. On 16th April, on the eve of their departure, a grand farewell party for the volunteers with a series of events was arranged by the citizens of Chandanagar. Shortly before 9 in the morning, the volunteers assembled at the house of Motilal Roy. From there, in twos, they marched to the house of Commissioner of Police to receive their passports and passage money. They then returned home for final leave-taking and later returned to the house of Motilal Roy. From there, they moved to Boroi Chanditala Temple to receive the blessing of the Goddess of the Victory, after which the volunteers were garlanded and photographed on the Vil Dig Dig ground. After these ceremonies were over, they marched under their team leader, Haradhan Bokshi, with the French tricolor at their head towards Kalshini Thana, singing Bande Mataram song. A public rally was arranged by administrator for the volunteers in front of the Kalshini Thana. Administrator addressed them there. On behalf of the volunteers, Haradhan Bokshi replied to the address of administrator. Then vast assembly of citizens, officials, and volunteers was addressed by Charu Chandra Rai. Finally, volunteers took leave from the crowd. The next halt was made at Ruton Lodge. Residents of Babu Jogendranath Bosch, where a huge garden party was organized in honor of the volunteers. Distinguished guests from Kolkata, that is Justice Choudhury, Sir S. P. Sina, Sir N. Chakraborty, Raja Prafullo K. Tagore, G.K. Dev, B.C. Mitter, Dr. S.K. Mollik, Panchkohri Banerjee, and many others were present at the party. All senior government officials and citizens of Chandranagar were also uh, present, including the administrator C. Vincent, Judge M. Morris, Magistrate M. Levonshire, Collector M. J. Parnon, Mayor Jogendranath Mukhopadhyay, Police Commissioner, Civil Sergeant, and the principal of the college. After the party, volunteers dressed themselves into khaki and marched towards the railway station, which was already packed with goodly throng. As they came out of Rutun Lodge, the ladies of the house blew crown cells, honoring them in orthodox fashion. On the way to the station, volunteers were cheered and garlanded by the people of Chandanagar. The train left Chandanagar station to the accompaniment of a volley of blank curtains. At Howrah Railway Station, volunteers were given another farewell reception by the Bengali leaders and people of Kolkata. Long before the hour the train was timed to arrive, the platform was a sea of human heads. And as the train came in, vociferous shouts greeted the Bengali soldiers of Chandanagar. Among others, Motilal Ghosh, Dr. S.P. Sharbadikari, Pandit Sundarlal, Pramotanath Roy Choudhury, Rai Jyotindranath Choudhury, Hirendranath Dotto, Shed Shuklal Karnani were present on the platform. Several gentlemen addressed the volunteers and many of the offerings made to them. On the next day, the details of the farewell program, along with the comments, took large space in all the newspapers of Bengal. I just quote, quote a few lines from one of the leading newspapers you can see on the slide. This came in the Ananda Bajar Patrika.
Volunteers reached Pondicherry at early morning of 19th April. From railway station, volunteers marched to the residence of the governor who came down and shook hands with them. He was impressed seeing the turnout and the smartness of the volunteers. He commented, the Bengalis, better educated, more intelligent and polite, will make better soldiers. From governor's residence, they moved to garrison and were received by the French adjutant of the garrison. Volunteers were accommodated at the troops' barrack and given a cookhouse, though in the initial days they had to dine out at outside hotels due to non-existence of rationing system. Volunteers were issued with uniform consisting of two shirts, one full pan, a pair of boots, a pair of potties, one evening cap, one hat, two towels, and a coat. At Pondicherry, volunteers were re-examined re by the medical officer at the local hospital and were found suitable for military service. Volunteers of Chandranagar, along with other volunteers of French India, formed the 17th company of the 11th Colonial Infantry. Lieutenant N. Gile was the commander of 17th company. Volunteers could make good impression on the military officers there, whose comment is found in a letter by Haradhan Bokshi. Quote, all the officers are of opinion that we shall make excellent soldiers and marking our way of marching, the adjutant said, we are already soldiers fit to be drilled with guns. Volunteers training remain restricted to drill with arms only. Normally they used to practice drill from 6 to 8.30 a.m. Volunteers did their training at Pondicherry quite well. Authority became satisfied with the standard of training. In the first week of June, Lieutenant Gile wrote a letter of appreciation to Motilal Roy of Chandanagar about the standard of the training of volunteers. Extract of the letter is on the screen. The last line is very interesting. Without exaggeration, they are the champions of my detachment. In the farewell meeting of first batch at Chandanagar on 16 April, it was announced that two more batches of much greater strength will be recruited from Chandanagar within a short period. From mid-April to mid-June, 45 applications for joining French army were received, out of which eight were withdrawn by the applicants or their guardians. Of the remaining 37, 26 presented themselves for medical examination, 11 being absent. Seven were found unfit and five were withheld for re-examination later. So 14 only passed as fit for military service. British authority claimed four selected volunteers as their subject and French authority had to release them prior to sending Pondicherry. Two selected candidates changed their mind and did not report to administrator prior to leaving Pondicherry. Rest eight recruits were sent to Pondicherry on 16 June. On 15 June, volunteers of second batch were given a farewell through a private party at the residence of Jogendranath Shed. Administrator and the elites of the town were present in the meeting. Two selected volunteers became medically unfit at Pondicherry. Rest six joined training with first batch. No further recruitment was conducted at Chandanagar after the second batch. Initially, it was planned that after the basic training at Pondicherry, the volunteers will be sent to Djibouti for military service. Later, the plan was changed and it was decided to send them to France. After the basic training, at the end of June 16, volunteers were sent to Toulon. Upon reaching France, volunteers were sent for artillery training. Moranjan Dash could not complete his training as he died in tuberculosis. Rest qualified in artillery training and posted to one of the 75 millimeter artillery battery at Bardun. They could make good impression in the training. One of the French officers made the following remarks, remarks about them. These remarks, you may think that it is little exaggeration of the fact, but it came in the newspaper. I am quoting it from the newspaper. Volunteers moved towards Bhardun on 29 June 1970, 
1917 with full marching days, including haversacks and tinned food. They reached Bhardun on 2nd July. Volunteers served with French army till the end of the war in different places, including Toulon, Bardun, Bijarte, Tripliton, Argonne, Saint Mihil, etc. Few of the volunteers were posted to Indochina after the armistice. Shiddeshwar Mullik and Haradhan Bokshi were sent for higher training during their stay in France. The Chandranagar soldiers, under the hardship of war, performed well and earned special praise from the general and commanding officer for their precision and his speed in firing artillery rounds and promptness in carrying out orders and good behavior. Volunteer, they all received two commemorative medals for participating in World War I. These are victory internally and volunteer. Balai Chandranath received Kaus de Guer for his outstanding performance in the battlefield. Amitabh Ghosh earned a special praise from the commanding officer for his extraordinary sense of responsibility and was fortunate in having an interview with Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig. As I told earlier that Moranjan Das died during training and was buried at Bijarte. Rabindranath Roy had his three fingers of the left hand blown off by pieces of sharp nail. Within the service period, most of the volunteers came on home, home leave once. First leave group came in Chandranagar in the second week of March 1918. In a war which has been daily exacting a toll of thousands of human lives, a band of 26 volunteers cannot possibly mean an appreciable accession of strength to the French army, fighting in various theatres of war. Why then it was so important for the Bengalis? Why then uh, were the series of demonstrations held by the sensible people of Kolkata and Chandranagar? The answer is that the Bengalis wanted to remove the unjust level of non martial race placed on them. They wanted to lift restriction for recruiting them in army. The demonstration and movement made by the Bengalis were to draw the attention of the British Indian Authority to the example which has been set by France in trusting the much maligned Bengalis. And it probably worked. After a few months from the departure of Chandranagar volunteers, British authority made recruitment open for the Bengalis, initially a double company, and later a regiment composed of Bengalis was raised and sent to Mesopotamia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Colonel Hawk. Now we have the last and final paper uh, by Mr. Mafid al -Hawk. Uh, Mafid Bhai is almost known to everyone here, I'm sure. Uh, those uh, who have come out from outside Bangladesh probably also know him, but uh, just to give a small uh, kind of an intro, uh, Mr. Mafid al -Hawk, uh, is, is a publisher, author, culture activist, and uh, uh, very much close to what uh, we call one of the very important uh, institution of post-71 and that is Liberation War Museum. He has written extensively uh, on, 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 on different uh, issues. And Mr. Hawk is going to speak um, uh, something about which uh, I think Iftika Iqbal referred to also, Kazi Nuzul Islam. So we are going to have a paper today, a, a presentation uh, on a topic which uh, we, uh, you know, known to most of the Bangladeshis also, but I'm sure uh, Mr. Hawk will enlighten us uh, with a perspective which maybe uh, some of us are not familiar. And the title of his paper is From War Front to the Front of National Liberation and the Impact of World War I on Qazi Nuzul Islam. Mofi Bhai, thank you. 20 minutes or 25 minutes? Okay, go ahead. Thank you, President Pierre Ahmed. Good afternoon to the participants. I am the last speaker and I think I came as a blessing to you. You have to endure me only for 25 minutes, 20 minutes. And uh, the theme of my paper is from war front to the front of national liberation struggle, impact of World War, World War I on Qazi Nazrul Islam. I begin with a quotation from a letter by Mr. K. Mukherjee, a Bengali soldier who fought in Tulo, France. The letter was written from there, 20th June, 1916. I quote, I am happy to inform you that the day of our glory has arrived. Tomorrow morning, we will proceed to the battlefield. It is a time of life and death struggle. 
We will do our utmost to show the valor of the Bengalis in the battlefield. We will show that the Bengalis are not a cowardice nation. Uh, I think these words reflect uh, the spirit of the Bengali nation, which was again, we found in 1971 during our war of liberation. Kazi Nazrul Islam, a young recruit from Bardwan, took the train from Howrah to Lahore in September 1917 to join the British Indian Army. He was 18 years old and about to appear in the school final exam. It was a long journey crossing the whole length of the Indian subcontinent and for Nazrul, it was also a long journey he had to undertake to board the train to a new life. A drifter since his early boyhood, this trouble took Nazrul from the provincial milieu of Bengal to the cosmopolitan arena of the contemporary world. Nazrul joining the army was a new experience, not only for him, but also for Bengal. It was very much different from the reality of other parts of India, as the First World War opened the doors of opportunity for Bengalis to be enlisted in the armed services after a long denial of almost 60 years. After the mutiny of 1857, which rocked colonial domination of the East India Company, the Indian subcontinent was brought under Her Majesty's rule, and the recruitment manual of the Indian Army was drastically changed. Bengal and Bihar, the hotbed of rebellion, was considered unreliable partners, and recruitment was shifted to Punjab and the peripheral regions. The recruitment of soldiers from Bengal was stopped totally. Such practice gradually gave rise to the myth of so-called martial race. Nirosi Chaudhary, a literateur who also proved his excellence as a military historian, wrote, I quote, before the mutiny, the Northern Indian Army was indeed recruited from the so-called martial classes, whereas after the mutiny, as a result of deliberate policy, Recruiting was predominantly in the Punjab and the so-called martial races were assumed to exist more or less exclusively in that province." Unquote. With the outbreak of the World War I in 1914, the demand to get soldiers from the colonial countries increased greatly, and this has been discussed in the earlier papers also. The first major intake of the Bengalis was in the Bengal Ambulance Corps, which was elaborately discussed by the earlier discussants and they proved their worth in the Mesopotamian theater of war. Subsequently, recruitment for Bengali Palton started in August 1916, almost two years after the outbreak of the World War I. From July 1917, recruitment became more widespread, which led to the formation of 49 Bengali regiment where Kazi Nazrul Islam served. When Nazrul boarded the train to Lahore sometime in September, October 1917, he left behind an early life full of struggle and vibrancy. He was born in May 1899 in an impoverished professional family at the remote village of Churulia, Bardwan. The place was adjacent to Bihar and a hub of multiculturalism. Nazru lost his father at an early age in 1908 and had to look for ways to augment the earning of the family. He had to leave the school and join a traveling folk musical group known as Leto Dal, Leto being a folk form of presenting mythical stories through music and dance. After working two years with the group, Nazrul returned back to school to continue his studies. But it was not an easy task, and he drifted from one school to another, from one place to the other, at one time even studying deep in East Bengal village of Trishal Maimon Singh. While studying at the Shiarshal Raj High School of, at Raniganj, Nazrul came in contact with Nivaran Chandra Ghatak, a disciple of great revolutionary Jatindranath Mukherjee, popularly known as Bagha Jatin or Tiger Jatin. In January 1917, school teacher Nivaran Chandra was arrested by the police for seditious activities, and Nazrul became a suspect. His stipend was withheld only to be reinstated in May 1917. At such a time, the announcement of recruitment in the Indian Army came to the notice of Kazi Nazrul Islam, and along with his classmate Shweila Jananda Mukhopadhyay, he came to Kolkata to get enlisted in the Army. He passed all the tests and went immediately to Fort William to be among the new recruits. Bengal at that time was vibrant with revolutionary and patriotic fervor. It started in 1905 with, when the partition of Bengal gave rise to a unique and massive movement known as Chhadeshi Andolan. 
Rabindranath Tagore came out on the street with his composition of patriotic songs. The popular movement also aroused revolutionary spirit, culmination of which was the abortive attempt of Bagha Jatin in June 1915 to bring arms from Germany for a nationwide uprising. Jatin Mukherjee laid down his life in the skirmishes at the bank of river Buri Balam. Nazrul, later on in 1930, wrote a memorable poem on Jatin Mukherjee, which was included in his book, Pralai Shikha, Flames of Apocalypse. He wrote, quote, Balashore on the bank of river Buri Balam, the holy heart of New India, the horizon of dawn turned red with battle, as though it was the verge of dusk. Tangent to the azure vault of the sky, trembled the blue mountain peaks, Whose is this divine madness to fetch a setting sun back to the Janet's core? With gushes of blood from his throbbing heart, he reddens the pallor of the sun. This is the backdrop of Kazi Nazrul Islam joining the British Indian Army. The train to Lahore traveled against an azure sky when divine madness tried to fetch a setting sun back to Janet's core. The world was in turmoil and so was Bengal. Kazi Nazrul Islam served the army for about 30 months, which was also the formative period of his life. His army life was mostly confined in Karachi, where he got promoted as quartermaster Habildar, that is Habildar in charge of logistics. Although he did not got the baptism of fire in the battlefield, but many of his colleagues had fought in Iraq, in France, and in, in, the bat in other battlefields. Their experiences of the battlefield became part of the war experiences of Nazrul. Moreover, the war game the major powers played highlighted the political intrigues that was going on all over the Arab and Maghreb countries with the role of Turkish Khilafat at the center. The October Socialist Revolution became victorious in Russia in 1917, and its impact was great on the Muslims of Central Asia. The news about the socialist transformation in Russia trickled down to the barracks of Indian soldiers. It is known from his colleagues that Nazrul was well aware of the Russian Revolution and followed with deep interest the developments there. The barrack life of Indian Army itself was one of cosmopolitanism with soldiers from many cultures mingling together. This also proved to be a blessing to Nazrul, a young man devoted to music. There was abundance of musical instruments, from piano organ to string instruments. Nazrul also got the opportunity to brush up his elementary knowledge of Persian through contact with accomplished teacher. There were few descriptions of barrack life of Nazrul available, which showed how he devoted his time in Paltan both to literature and to music. Shambhu Roy, a senior soldier stationed at Karachi Garrison, wrote, quote, Kazi was fond of reading. He had in his collection most of the works of Rabindranath and Sharad Chandra. Apart from that, he used to subscribe various magazines, including Probashi, Bharat Borsho, Manushiyo, Mormobani, Shobuj Patro, etc. I have also seen the Seditious Committee's report in his collection, which showed his respect for Bengal revolutionaries and their party, unquote. Shomburai further wrote, quote, we had all type of musical instruments supplied to the polton. Everything from folding table, harmonium to banjo, clarionet, coronet, violin, etc. There was no dearth of singers and musicians. Almost every evening they would gather at the front yard of Nazrul's quarter and played music. The audience used to inspire them with natural expressions like Chalao Pan Shibel Ghoriya, Ghi Chop Chop Kabuli Motor, De Gorur Gadhuye. The last expression, wash the cow as you like, was an expression that became part of Nazrul's famous poem, criticizing the caste system and its practices, the division within the Muslim society. But Shambhu Roy failed to mention that Kazi Nazrul Islam also subscribed to other literary magazines published by the Muslim community, and prominent among them was the Bangiyo Musulman Shahitta Patrika and Shaugat. His writings started to appear in those magazines. He also established contact by mail with the editor and publisher of these journals. Prominent among them was Mujaffar Ahmed, a legendary and pioneering communist leader of India. This proved to be a great friendship and had a big influence on Nazrul. 
The writings of Nazrul Islam, published in various literary journals under the name of Habildar Kaji Nazrul Islam, need to be studied more deeply. There were also other writings penned at Karachi Cantonment and published later on, which reflected his life and time in the active service. One of the major features of such writings was that Nazrul tried to depict diverse experience of life, love, and rebellion, being too, diverse experience of life, love and rebellion being two great component. He also reflected the changes going on in Afghanistan, Iraq, Turkey, as well as in Russia. He reflected the life of a soldier fighting in various fronts, including the Vardu Trench, the forest near Paris, the camp at the bank of River Seine, Hindenburg Line, Sahara Desert of Africa, Kurdistan, Azizia, Kut al Amra, Karbala, Baghdad, etc. Such writings created an imp impression that Nazrul joined the battle in Mesopotamia, which was a distant possibility. Nevertheless, it was obvious that Nazrul in his writings started to express the broader experience of humanity in a large canvas. The world of 1913 was no more, and with the end of war in 1918, it was obviously a new beginning. The military service had made a deep impact on those who served. Lawrence James, in his book, Raj, The Making of British India, wrote, quote, the India under parliamentary scrutiny was not the country it had been five years before. Like every other participant in the war, it had suffered severe internal strains, which has bruised and shaken old social and economic structures. Soldiers serving in Europe had had their eyes opened to new world and opportunities, unquote. India itself was going through major shifts in its politics. Congress had set home rule within a federal, federal empire as its first priority. The conflict with Germany and the Axis power inspired the revolutionaries to get into action. The Ghadar party, the revolt party, inspired the Sikh emigre communities to come up in support of an uprising. Raja Mahendra Pratap, with support of Amir Habibullah of Afghanistan, declared himself as head of the provisional government of India. Raj Bihari Ghosh of Bengal, a colleague of Bagha Jatin, after the failure of Ghadar attempt at revolt, surfaced in Japan. Birendranath Chattopadhyay, based in Berlin, established contact with the Bolsheviks. So was also the doings of M.N. Roy, another architect of the Communist Party in India. The soldiers returning home from various garrisons and fields of war, enriched by the traumatic experiences, confronted a reality that is much different from the world they left behind. Lawrence James wrote, quote, Indian soldiers who returned home from various fronts at the turn of 1918 found a country in a state of flux. It was entering the first phase of an industrial revolution and was distressed by food shortages, inflation, high prices, and a devastating pandemic. Alongside hunger and sickness, there were their offspring, discontent, and restlessness. In turn, these generated a feeling that great, perhaps catastrophic events were just around the corner, unquote. With the dismantling of 49 Bengali regiment, Kaji Nazrul Islam returned to Bengal in March 1920. He took shelter at the office of Bongio Musulman Shahitya Shomiti, sharing a room with Mujaffar Ahmed. The soldier came back home to take up his pen. As per rule, he also reported to the district collector of Bordwan, who dutifully offered him a job of sub-registrar in the land revenue department, as it was the common practice to support the war veterans. But Nazrul refused to be a cog in the wheel of the British Empire and jumped into the unknown to devote himself fully to literary pursuit. The rest is history, and that history has been made by the publication of Nazrul's long poem, Bidrohi, The Rebel, in January 1922. The poem established Kazi Nazrul Islam as the standard bearer of the struggle of national liberation and electrified the nation. Professor Binoy Sharkar, author of the book Futurism of Young Asian, published in 1922 from Berlin, hailed the poem as Upanishad of the Individual and termed Nazrul as the initiator of the new age, the age of rebellion. Incidentally, immediately after his return from active service, 
Nazrul joined hands with Comrade Mujaffar Ahmed to publish a news weekly called Nabu Jug or The New Age. In 1922, Nazrul started to publish a bi weekly newspaper of his own titled Dhum Ketu or The Comet. Soon the publication was banned and Nazrul was put up in jail. He proved himself to be a rebel both in his spirit as well as in his actions. The spirit and actions which got molded by the rich experience of the World War I. A soldier of the British Indian Army fighting for the crown became a soldier of national liberation struggle fighting against British colonial domination. Thus returned Kazi Nazrul Islam from the front of World War I. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mukhid uh, Bhai. Well, the floor is now open for uh, comments and uh, questions. If you have comments, please uh, keep it uh, limited so that others can uh, join in. Uh, just show your hands and we'll continue. Uh, the first and then second, yeah. And uh, please introduce yourself. Okay. I'm a student in the Department of English, University of Dhaka. I just want to ask uh, Rana Chin a simple question. Uh, who coined the term Bhadralok warriors and was it already in use during the war? Okay, thanks. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Imtiaz. <coughs> uh, my name is Shahid Nuzrul. Uh, for this international conference, I am a legal American. Maybe uh, for this international conference, I am an American with Bangladesh descent. So I'll make a quick, uh, everything in one minute, uh, a comment an observation and a question. Basically, maybe I should uh, limit my comment to the fact that if you're talking about Nozrul and if you're talking about 1914 and 1918 or 1917 and 1920, you should start or end or somewhere it should be there that uh, it is Bolo Unno to Mamoshi. So uh, that resonates the sentiment uh, with this crowd and, and this area and this region and for the world. Uh, that should be understood. Secondly, uh, I would like to think that um, uh, it is about the uh, next international conference. It's not important who organizes that, but so long it should be organized. And that should cover a period or um, the um, ideas has to do with uh, uh, Bangladesh international politics of 1950s late. That's one part. The other part would be, uh, I'm thinking, I'm not, uh, again, I'm a international management uh, uh, material, so I, uh, you, you guys have to figure it out how it should be done. And the other part has to do with, for example, the, um, the, uh, the Bengali Rohingyas or Rohingyas, they are also uh, the Bengali, uh, it's like same family, different species, Rohingyas, same Bengali, different Bengali. So what is Bengal? What is the, um, the, uh, the cultural boundary of Bengal? So maybe it is time that we should look at the big picture in a true way. That is, let's think and promote and advance the ideas of one South Asia, before we start uh, talking or uh, uh, disseminating the one world thing, because of course everything should be together. Um, so these are the ideas, please, uh, uh, give and take. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, one and then two. Go ahead first, on the top. And then you. Uh, Go ahead. Okay, I'm Faisal, uh, law graduate from University of Dhaka. So thank you very much to all the presenters who made us that how unknown the known was. So my question is that during the Second World War, there were several military establishments in the Eastern Bengal. So is there any during First World War? Thank you. Yes. Hi, um, I have two questions, one for Dr. Kaushik Roy and one for uh, Mufid, Mr. Mufid al um, My name is Kazi Rahman. I am an entrepreneur, but um, yeah. So my first question relates to the policy of recruiting Indians or Bengalis in the Indian Army. And my question specifically is, 
Why was, what was the idea behind the policy to hire uneducated people into the British Raj, especially the Indians? And my second question, which relates to Mr. Mufid al haq is why did Bengalis and Indians in general um, fail to capitalize their privileged position after World War I to improve the conditions of Indians and Bengalis in general? The corollary would be if you look at the women's emancipation women's emancipation after World War II, women were hired into industrial jobs when there was a shortage of labor. Yet when the World War II ended, there was a huge universal suffrage. Pe women's rights became a big issue. But after World War I, it seemed that we just gave up. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, hi, I'm R uh, Rick Fogarty. Um, I just have one very simple question. Uh, first of all, I, I want to say that, that this is a, a really fascinating panel and, and I, I, I thank you for, for, for all four presentations. Um, but uh, just uh, uh, for Colonel Hawk, uh, just one simple question. You, you showed, if I, I remember correctly, the, in the second batch of recruitment that four uh, recruits were turned down due to British objections. And I'm assuming that that's because of their prior political activity. But I just, I, I, and I don't know if you know more, but I would just ask if maybe you, you know a little bit more about these four, uh, these four folks who were, who were turned down. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, uh, thanks to all the, uh, uh, all the presenters. Um, uh, my, my question is that I found, when I was a, ch I was a young kid, when we, we, we came to know about Siraj, the Battle of Palasi, we know the the story of Sun Frey, who actually fought with great vigor as a friend as a friend uh, with uh, um, Nawab, and I could get a sort of when this governor um, Mohtin knew is was urging that it will be treated as a scene if they don't <laughs> sort of uh, come forward. So it. it like you, you, you all presented uh, the similar story of Beng Bengal's involvement in, in initially the French front and then the British front. So I think I would like to I'd, I'd like to hear a little more uh, how the, the presence of France uh, was there uh, throughout the uh, colonial period in in in, in Indian history. So it, it is diplomatically. What was the main standing of France in especially Indian subcontinent beside, uh, be, beside the British uh, because yesterday there was like some debate um, uh, 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 when, when our friend also presented in, in, in similar regard. I would like to just hear a little more from any of you uh, on this front. Was this French friendship um, uh, how it was <laughs> seen then uh, in the society and the front. Sure. Yes, please. Yeah, I am from Alias Francis uh, Chittagong. Yeah, I am very much impressed by the presentation by Mr. Hawk or Nazrul. And I have uh, just a question, and I'd like to say that this First World War contributed uh, really a lot to frame the ideas of Nazrul as a rebellion poet. And also, you said that he was very much in touch with Muzaffar Ahmad, who is the great leader of the Communist Party in India, as a founder also. So would you like to say that uh, these two combinations had really uh, re reframed the poetic sentiment of Nazrul, and that, how, that is how our Bengali literature got a different dimension. I would like to know from you. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Yeah, to, uh, right. Go ahead. Say congratulations and thank you for the wonderful papers presented. But the, I feel that one particular issue of Bengalis being portrayed as non-martial people this, if you think, has been 
has changed over the years or over the activities of the Bengalis. If someone would like to talk a little more on this, because practically in all the papers, this was mentioned that the Bengalis were considered labeled as non martial race. And the for the second, there's going to be another conference. And if the French wants us to know about their role as a colonial power, then I suggest that we have we, we, we try and make access to first-hand materials, like the one uh, gentleman from Yadapur who, who, had, who, who I think who, uh, discovered a book and is involved in the translation of that. The reason being that when you read these accounts of colonial masters or colonial rulers ruling a, a different part of the land than their own, then you get a picture which is the observation of an anthropologist because an, 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 a person who's not a native of that place gives a different picture because all uh, they do not observe a lot of things. So there's one series in which I had a little, you know, I had a little opportunity to work as an editor this was a series called Oxford in Asia Historical Reprint Series. And uh, it was um, a series which sold extremely well simply because the people who were involved in editing and writing were books. Uh, where the original original books were borrowed from the uh, British Museum and India Office Library, and there was this, it was introduced by an expert on the field. I think that was a very well planned series, but this could become you see because the time lag is there. Of course, it will be very difficult to get, uh, but. Uh, the uh, libraries in the West, they seem to have this talent of uh, getting things out. The, the colonial masters, they have been able to take it back with them to the colonial headquarters as booties of war. So this, this may be considered by the people who organize a second conference. And I think as a first conference in this, I must congratulate also the organizers of the, the present conference because we would have known each one of us, I think we are looking, some of us are looking back, some of us are, and, and some have lost touch with the past they are also looking back and trying to interpret the the present the present comments made by the historians with the hindsight knowledge presented by the historians who who passed through this. I hope uh, I'm able to express my feelings and. I have now said what a small publisher would say. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, please go ahead. 
Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Abdul Hafiz. I just uh, I recently retired from Bangladesh Army. I'm I'm a little bit curious uh, to know about to know a little bit more about the volunteers of Chandanagar from uh, Mr. Lutfal Haq. You mentioned about the motivation of this uh, motivation for joining the f uh, f joining the French Army of these 26 volunteers. There was a mention in your paper that uh, there was a promise by the French government that after the war they will be they will be uh, inducted or they will be given or granted French citizenship. What was the primary motivation of these uh, 26 uh, Bengalis who joined and fought alongside the French uh, army in First World War? And from the religion point of view, you also mentioned that the French government made an appeal to the Hindus and Muslims of the then British India so that they join. Did you find in your research, uh, was, there, was there any, any Muslim among the 26 volunteers or it was a it was all, all Hindu Bengalis who joined this, uh, uh, this war with the French army. Thank you very much. I guess, uh, yes, we can get the response. Uh, you want, yeah, maybe uh, Kaushik, you start first and then. Yeah, I think I got one question from the gentleman in pink shirt and a scarf that uh, why the British selected the uneducated uh, recruits. I'll come back to that. But I think another gentleman also asked a question in a black coat, which we couldn't follow. Maybe later on you can repeat the question. Yeah. Till 1942, the British were interested only in recruiting the rank and file. They realized very early that if they recruit Indians as officers, the officer ko bin the brain of the army, they would lose control of the army. So about the rank and file, the dominant ideology in Britain, who had to be recruited from 1840s onwards, still 1880s, it became more stronger under Roberts and other, is that urban proletariat or under proletariat, urban proletariat, poor men in the urban areas, they suffer from bad habits, too much excess uh, bad habit, they take drugs, their health is bad, their food is bad, the air is polluted. So the British officers' uh, assumption, both for recruiting the British Army at home as well as the Indian Army, is that in the countryside, due to good air, good food, healthy exercise, you get a lot of physically fit men. And also because they haven't gone into the new schools, they are uncorrupted by civilizing influence. The, same British attitude was operating as regard Irish recruitment or Scottish recruitment. Get men from the hills, get men from the countryside, not from the Welsh cities. Now about the India, the rural countryside, they classified, the British classified the Indian rural people into three categories. Rich or middle peasantry, poor peasantry, landless people. The British were not recruiting any landless people from the countryside because of the lack of food they were the British regarded they are malnourished, will not be able to, they are not capable of soldiering. Again, the British also argued there's a huge correspondence going on among the British officers. They are taking recruitment very seriously and military department branch in South Asia was the biggest and fattest. After that comes home and then finance. The British argued that the rich peasantry will not join the army because they are getting more from their land, patrimonial holdings, more than 60 or 80 acres with several bullocks. And the landless people, besides being malnourished, they were actually of the lower caste. And that if lower caste, Dalits, untouchables, even lower caste among the Muslims, they said that there are categories like Julahas, etc. in the 90s. So if they're recruited, the prestige or status of the Raj sword arm will go down in local society. We can't allow that. Rich peasantry will not come for economic reason. Landless laborers, no no for social, ideological, and practical reasons. So only left is the small peasantry, 20 acres of land, four uh, bullocks, and their younger sons who are not absorbed in agriculture, they comprise the bulk of the Indian peasantry. In peacetime, it was 50 to 20,000 men per year annually. It was a long service volunteer army. But during the two wars, all hell broke loose because then you need 60,000, 70,000, 55,000 per month. And then they have to recruit landless people, various other groups who are considered marginal. But the real break came in 42 onwards when they started recruiting officers. The days of the Raj was numbered. Thank you. Thank you very much.
So, I'll just add a, a line to what uh, Kaushik said that as far as the British were concerned, uh, they also uh, had a, uh, a kind of uh, a view towards even their own uh, recruitment in the British Army they, uh, during the Victorian period. They were, uh, uh, it's what they called, uh, you know, the, the yeoman uh, farmer uh, was sturdy, was honest, was upright, and they tended to apply the same yardstick. Uh, to the country folk in India. That's why they had this preference also for rural communities. Um, uh, the uh, gentleman asked me about the Bhadralok warriors. I, it wasn't a term in contemporaneous use. It's just something that I thought would be a suitable title for the paper. So uh, really speaking, there wasn't any, uh, any resonance to, to its use at that particular point in time at all. Um, yeah, that's it. There are a few questions about the Chandanagar volunteers. Firstly, why these four British citizens were not uh, were uh, uh, deported or the, uh, they were not taken in the Chandanagar, Chandanagar force? Uh, because they are British citizens. And th at that period, British were not interested to include the Bengalis in the army. And there was a, a heavy lobbying going on in Calcutta and many uh, parts of uh, Bengal, including Dhaka, to take Bengali people in the army. As British was not interested, so some of the people from Bengal went to um, uh, Chandanagar, uh, Chandanagar when they heard that the uh, military recruitment is going on and they enlisted themselves. Not only in Chandanagar, in England also, um, uh, one chap, uh, Mr. Jogender, he was also from Bengal, he joined the British Army and he died in France. Uh, but the, he got this permission, special permission from the British authority. He wanted to become an officer as he was an engineer and working in England. But he was not given a commission. He was uh, told that if you want to join, you can join as a volunteer in uh, uh, some of the British regiment. Then he joined. Then the Indralal Roy, which uh, Rana China told, he also threatened the British authority, if you don't take us in the Royal uh, Air Force, then we are going to join the Briti uh, French uh, Air Force. Then uh, probably this was a bargaining point. They, the, those four or six uh, uh, airmen, Air, uh, Air Force officers, they also uh, wanted to take this advantage. So these four, they uh, actually joined the uh, volunteer, uh, Chandanagar volunteer, um, not informing the British authorities. But the British authority later on came to know uh, because it was so publicized in those period uh, that uh, British intelligence people, they came to know. And from the first uh, uh, big uh, uh, meeting, which was held on 6th, on 6th of uh, March, and uh, the news came in the paper that for the four regions, this meeting was not successful. One was this meeting was addressed with the administrator and some of the French people, they addressed the meeting in French language. This is one reason that the meeting did not uh, become successful. And the fourth reason was the presence of CID people, British CID people in the meeting. So they were monitoring who all are joining the French army. So it was not very difficult to identify these four. So they were identified and then, then they were not taken in the... Then someone says that the why um, uh, governor said that it will be seen if you don't join. Uh, actually, I translated the Bengali into English. I got this word from the Bengali uh, newspaper. Uh, there it was written, Pap Hobby, and it will be seen. Amra Bangalai Boli, the Pap Shetake, I have translated it into seen. Uh, another question was from uh, General Hafiz that. Uh, was there any Muslim volunteer in the Chandanagar? The address by the president was Hindu and Muslim both. But they, uh, I did not find any Muslim uh, volunteer in those 26. I have all the names of those volunteers, but there were no Muslim. Probably in Chandanagar there were very less number of Muslim, even if there was. I do not know. But the 26 uh, people, uh, no one was uh, uh, within this 26. And you ask another question, what was the motivation behind the um, uh, people, uh, they joined uh, 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 French armies? Uh, this cannot be, uh, I cannot answer this question, what was the motivation behind their joining. But extra loyalty can be one, question, uh, one thing, or uh, because 
নবাব অব ঢাকা জয়েন্ট ব্রিটিশ আর্মি এস সিপয় নবাব অব ঢাকা নবাব হাবিবুল্লাহ হি জয়েন্ট এস এ সিপয় রণদা প্রসাদ সাহা জয়েন্ট এস সিপয় কুমার অধিক্রম হি ওয়াজ এ হি ওয়াজ এ ভেরি রেপুটেড প্লিডার ইন কলকাতা বার কলকাতা কোর্ট হি অলসো জয়েন্ট এস এ সিপয় মন বাহাদুর সিং হি ওয়াজ সান অফ হিস্টোরিয়ান অক্ষয় কুমার মৈত্র হি অলসো জয়েন্ট এস এ সিপয় অল দিস ভদ্রলোক ক্লাস সামবডি হ্যাজ রেজ অবজেকশন অ্যাবাউট দি টার্ম ভদ্রলোক বাট অ্যাট দ্যাট পিরিয়ড this term was often seen in the newspaper that people from the bhadralok class are joining the army not the peasant not the um, uh, common people all people those who join in bangla uh, bengal the bengali double company they were almost everyone were from the bhadralok class later on when it was turned into a regiment when pouring of uh, the number of recruitment became more then only the rural people or the common people joined but initially all 228 people almost all of them were from the middle class or higher middle class so motivation i cannot say probably this was their extra loyalty to, uh, towards the um, colonial authority thank you mukti bhai There were quite a few questions on Qazi Nazrul Islam, and I think uh, the points have been rightly raised. He is a fascinating personality, and the way he molded himself, the influence that he has uh, gathered from so many quarters made him uh, a great poet. And uh, I, I tried to focus on the, his experience from uh, about joining the Indi British Indian Army and 38 months he served there and the Nazrul who joined the army and the Nazrul who came back. I think when he went to the army, he was 18 years old, but he had rich experience of life with him. And then that got enriched by the, the great opportunity he got to be in the British Indian Army to get connected with the wider world. And that world is a as we found in all literature that the world in 1913 and the world in 1918 or 1919 was a vastly different world. And the core of all this influence or connectivity was the struggle of the people for their freedom and especially the struggle of the do people dominated by colonialism. And that was reflected in, Bol in Bidruhi, the Bolovir, Balun, not the Mamashir. I didn't went for the poetics of the uh, of Nazrul Islam, that's another subject to discuss, but I think Nazrul, not only in his theme, but also in his stylistic, in his word choice of words, in his presentation, is a completely a new phenomena. And at the core is the syncretistic culture of Bengal, mingling all the traditions, the Hindus and Muslims and uh, the s subaltern <coughs> or the uh, rich tradition of literature and uh, music. So. It's a great blending, and that's Nazrul, what made Nazrul, Nazrul. And uh, it's, it's, I think Shahid Nazrul has pointed out rightly that the resonance of his poem is something really great, Bolobir. And I am not a reciter, but I can say that uh, the very words he coined and the, the theme that he tried to present in this poem, Bidruhi, the rebel, it started with Bolobir, Bolo un noto momoshir, shir, nehari, amari, noto shir, oi shikhor, hima, drir. You can uh, get the resonance of the words that he used, which come like a, like a uh, tornado or like a waterfall. And also in this poem, he said that, momo akhate bashe, baje basher bashuri. I have the bamboo flute in my one hand, arhate rona turjo. And on the other hand, I have the bigle of the war. So you can see the influence of the experience of First World War also in, in his renderation of his poems. But uh, I think what uh, has been neglected is his minor writings, his early writings, which also reflect a great experience of the First World War, like the Bathar Dan, like Bound Dele Ratto Kahini, which are difficult to read, which is not, uh, one will say that, well-constructed fiction or work of literature, but that has many elements which are very important for a social historian 
or for cultural studies. And that's why I said that the writings of Nazrul need to be studied more deeply. And uh, thank you for raising this point, and uh, we can carry on this discussion. And also, uh, I think uh, another point was raised that why the Indians did not take the opportunity of the First World War in the post-First World War scenario. I think if you look at the political dimension, you will see in 1919, it's Jallianwala Bagh. And there was no great protest against Jallianwala Bagh, and Tagore made a lone protest by, I mean, uh, he refused his sar, uh, knighthood. knighthood and returned it to the royalty. And then uh, from the 21 or 20s, we have this great movement of when Mahatma Gandhi came to the scene and the Khilafat and non-cooperation movement, which was a joint movement of the Hindus and Muslims, and which was actually the dream of Nazrul Islam, and which he, re he represented through all his writings and all his actions that the national struggle, when we talk about the national liberation struggle, it goes beyond the religious division or other divisions, and that has been embodied by Nazrul in many great ways. But there were strong movements. There were also the working class movement which started to pick up but it was a difficult struggle because the British colony was the jewel in the crown and the British was not ready to get, give any concession or, so the, the struggle was there. Maybe it did not succeed in post-World War I scenario, but it succeeded in post-World War II scenario, but not in a very unfortunate way. And that's also another history. And uh, as for his relation with Professor M Comrade Mujaffar Ahmed, I think this is, uh, he, had this uh, socialistic uh, elements of socialistic ideas from his early days. It's not that uh, it, his contact with a uh, renowned communist leader has influenced him into this. This was, I think, Nazrul was naturally was upholding such ideas. And also it's very interesting that when Nazrul came back from the front, he first went to stay with Shwela the Mukherjee, the, his friend who was refused entry into the British Army. And he stayed with Sri Lajananda Mukherjee for a few days in a communal uh, house, a mess in, we call in Bengali. And then the household workers and the cook, they refused to cook for a Muslim. So he had to leave the house and went to stay with Mujaffar Ahmed. So these are historical incident and accident. This does not, uh, I mean, determine the character of a person or a poet. But Nazrul was a liberal, highly secular, and these things did not have influenced him in any way. But I think uh, if we look into the broader perspective of the First World War, Kazi Nazrul Islam is a fascinating subject to study, and we have studied him in many ways, but I think his participation in the British Indian Army, the experience that he earned through this, even his musicality, the elements of, in his music, which have elements from the Central Asian sources or other sources, also speaks about his uh, army experience or his uh, days in the British Indian Army. So Nazrul, what made Nazrul, Nazrul Islam, is diverse, diversity and his contact with many, many sources. He, he can be, take elements from religious uh, movements, from revolutionary movements, from various kind of social actions. And this syncretistic tradition of Bengal has been most strongly reflected in Kazi Nazrul Islam. And Bangladesh has truly hailed him as the national poet of Bangladesh. I think this is a journey that Nazrul made. And also Nazrul, the importance of Nazrul in our psyche, in our present day reality, and for our future. But the connectivity with First World War is very important and needed to be studied more thoroughly and deeply. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, with your permission, can I just take half a second? Sure. Here's an observation. I mean, it should not take a, a G7 nation to recognize the fact that Baundeler Atokotha may be difficult to translate, but how about Kazi Nozrud Islam, the life-size statue sitting inside the garage of Nozul Institute, or why shouldn't there be a Shubhash statu statue in the middle of the independent monument? I think uh, gentlemen of the panel and everyone attending should find the links between old and new and the future. Thank you.
Great. Uh, I guess uh, we're almost done. And since uh, you know, I've been given this responsibility to chair the session, and as chair, I need to say something. Otherwise, they will say that you know, you're just sitting down like a duck and doing nothing. I have a couple of things, and since uh, you know, I've been here uh, yesterday and today. Uh, I, I, you know, it should not sound as a summing up of the entire thing, because there were other chairs who had also, uh, you know, wonderful things to say. A uh, couple of things I thought uh, the organizers can also, in fact. Uh, you know, look into. One is, I believe, uh, the, a book should come out of all the presentations. Uh, there should be a, and it should be an interesting book, I believe. I was looking into uh, the 15 people, well, one or two could not turn up, but even if you, you know, get their papers, uh, should be do. it should be an interesting, uh, you know, thing to do, because uh, it gets both, uh, I don't want to make it north and south, uh, but something of that, you know, uh, you have uh, the people who, you know, faced the war more directly, uh, fought the war more directly, and uh, and those who were uh, at the peripheral end, but did contribute also. And and I think uh, it, it's it should be a fascinating look at this particular, you know, uh, volume, how scholars in the West and how. Uh, people in, in, in the East uh, are, are, are reflecting uh, on this, uh, on what is called the World War I. Now from there, number two, uh, the second point I think is uh, important, and I go back to a, uh, to a board that was established right after uh, the Second World War. Uh, uh, this is the Franco-German curriculum, uh, Franco-German textbook board, uh, which helped in a big way in what Europe today is, uh, you know, they got each other's hate literature out, uh, and there were other things also. Uh, I think uh, something of that kind is possible, and this particular conference uh, could be a beginning to think of a South Asian uh, board or a South Asian textbook board, uh, because uh, you know, looking at this Bengal panel, in fact, you know, whether from Kaushik uh, to Mr. You know. China's point of view uh, to, to my uh, right, uh, you know, you, you could see that uh, it went beyond all the borders and the boundaries. So a beginning could be, uh, you know, one can start thinking about writing a South Asian history, and I think uh, World War I gives us, uh, you know, the papers that were presented here gives us hope that it can go beyond something which got stuck in 47 and 71, uh, something that uh, the French and Germans could do uh, in, in, in the context of, uh, of Europe, uh, although they had a, a, a quite a bloody history. And uh, I would also request, uh, we do have uh, people from International Relations Department and History Department. Uh, we have a course actually, um, if I'm not wrong with the title, uh, International Relations Since 1919, is it, uh, Rosanna? Right, International Relations Since 1919. And I've always uh, questioned that particular uh, you know, course, even when I was a student, uh, that it really doesn't make sense. Uh, our students actually are so familiar with Hitler and Mussolini, they would even know what the Mus uh, Hitler would eat and, you know, who was what, you know, uh, but they would not know uh, nothing of uh, what we discuss today, uh, actually. You know, the names, uh, the Kallan Mukhabadda's names or any other names, you know, it's absolutely, even they would not know of the Mughal era or, 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 or some of the things of Nuzrul, uh, you know, they don't read. I don't think Nuzrul is uh, taught in IR. Uh, Tagore, Rabinath is taught, but not Nuzrul, if I'm, yeah. Uh, Rabinath is heavily taught uh, because of his contribution, you know, nationalism and other things, but not yet Nuzrul. And I think it'd be good to uh, start working on, on a course, in fact, uh, how you look uh, international relations in 1919 from, from the South. Uh, and, and, and that I think would be, uh, it could be challenging, but I think it would be more uh, meaningful. And from there I come to the third point. Uh, this could be referred to as a subaltern history uh, that the Bengal panel had, uh, but the public domain uh, hardly knows about this subaltern history. You know, this history, uh, you know, I think uh, Ranjit Guho made quite an effort uh, to have this entire subaltern history uh, mainstreamed, and it did mainst uh, get mainstreamed, 
but I still think uh, even uh, my university, Dhaka University, I, I believe it is lacking. And I, I know those of you, the students here and, and some faculty members uh, can take it farther, in fact, to how we can create subaltern history and have courses. Uh, and this could be in, in the Department of History, in Islamic Studies, uh, in International Relations, in Peace Studies, and all other related departments uh, that we have. The last point, uh, this I was talking to Mufidul Bhai, in fact, and uh, he was uh, telling me that we did have a war memorial on First World War, uh, but it was demolished, uh, I think it was uh, in, in Bahadur Shah Park, in the Victoria Park, but uh, after 71, or during that time, it was demolished uh, because of the nationalism and all, because that war memorial was built by the, by the British, if I'm not wrong? For the for the British, <laughs> so which was not acceptable. But now we can have a it was transferred. Anyway, so whatever. But I think a, a war memorial can be a new kind of a war memorial. Uh, you know, listening to yesterday's papers and today's papers, we can actually build uh, of the victims uh, of the South. Actually, you know, World War One with all the names. And it could actually have also Nozul's names, not necessarily who have died, but who have sacrificed. And uh, that will you know, create a kind of a, a knowledge which I think is, is, is uh, missing. Uh, I, I, I believe uh, you know, there's a lot to do. And, and some of the papers that we have heard uh, from yesterday and today, at least I enjoyed immensely and uh, benefited, uh, you know, got enriched, and I'm sure you know, those who are present here uh, must have had the same feeling knowing about war and colonies. But I'll tell you that we are a little bit ahead. I'll, I can tell, uh, you know, Rana Saab that I just came from Delhi and I uh, was telling about this conference and they had no idea that it was 100 years. You know, I said, oh my God. And it was quite a big conference where, you know, people were suddenly saying, oh yes, how come Dhaka is, you know, having a conference and, and, and not Delhi? But as Rana Saab was saying that, I think you are also planning something very, uh, soon, so I believe uh, Dhaka conference when it gets into the uh, you know uh, in the internet now that you know you can't hide anything in fact, and with all your pictures and I believe uh, the whole uh, all the presentations would be in the YouTube. That was the idea given to me. Uh, yeah, in the YouTube, uh, that you know so you become a kind of a global ambassadors, uh, you know, uh, uh, cyber ambassadors, which I believe uh, will help uh, others also to get excited about the about uh, you know this particular war and mainly uh, that we don't uh, uh, you know start repeating uh, wars in the in the future uh, my university is very much uh, uh, what you call part of the of the war uh, kind of uh, syndrome if i can use the word uh, this is the university which is very historical this is the university where we say it is the epicenter of genocide this is where actually the 71 genocide started you are you know it's, uh, you can roam around. Uh, we did uh, yesterday after the conference, we did, uh, some of us went to Modur Canteen to have uh, tea. There's a canteen actually. Uh, I don't think in the entire history of any university, this canteen uh, would be historical. It's a historical uh, canteen uh, because um, the students actually uh, made uh, X number of decisions in that canteen. And uh, the owner of the canteen uh, was killed uh, by the Pakistan army very brutally. Uh, uh, you know, very brutally. Uh, so, uh, we shouldn't forget that that was also the place where Muslim League was formed. The, also, the place of Muslim League earlier on. Uh, so, it's a historical canteen, and, and this is, uh, you know, if you roam around Haq University, you'll see X number of uh, monuments. So, we are very close uh, uh, to what uh, war means, and, and some of us, uh, as you know, uh, in the genocide uh, has, has sacrificed, and the trauma continues. Uh, even uh, today. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and I believe uh, you want, yeah, uh, the organizers definitely have to say uh, something at the end. Thank you very much. So on, on behalf of uh, Alliance Francaise de Dhaka, I want to thank the Dhaka University for hosting the international conference. I want to thank all the participants and um, also all the audience and the volunteers who uh, help
tremendously in organizing and making this conference a success. I want, of course, to thank again Olivier Litvin for having uh, launched and uh, organized this uh, program, which um, uh, is uh, concluded by this conference here today, but which continues with uh, an exhibition of photos which, is, which are now exhibited in uh, Alliance Francaise de Dhaka, which are going to be exhibited in the War Liberation Museum and which are going to be uh, exhibited uh, later on um, in different venues in the subcontinent. Thanks to Olivier Litvin and his initiative, we have uh, taken the colonies from uh, marginal, exotical representation, sometimes paternalistic, to uh, we have brought we brought them back to the center of representation and scholarship, and and given them their full dimension, the, their full dimension, the, the full dimension of their role in the World War uh, One, and until and unless the the role of colonies are given this due consideration, the 1914-1918 conflict loses its very dimension of the World War. And we often uh, address how colonies, how colonial empires, sorry, represented the colonies, influenced them and shaped them, but we rarely uh, actually address the issue of how colonies represented and shaped the world. And of course, um, until and unless the colonies uh, had brought their um, very heavy contribution in terms of human lives or resources, uh, the world would have been totally different. Addressing the participation, the role of uh, colonies in the World War I uh, helps in uh, building a counter discourse. Also, um, to helps also in uh, building more uh, actual, uh, more uh, relevant, intimate, and complex uh, um, images of uh, the, the war and the world, not only the the, the war. So thank you very much to all the participants and to all the, the partners. Uh, we are going to conclude this conference with a theme whose remembrance uh, which has been made in 2012 by the Imperial War Museum Research Department. It's part of a project uh, under the same name. It's funded by the Arts and Humanita Humanities Research Council under the Connected Communities Program to investigate the state of research into colonial troops and laborers in the world wars. The short film we are going to watch now will be uh, showcasing the findings of the project and act as a, as a discussion prompt and catalyst for future research. It's a 20 minutes movie. Thank you very much. The colonial experience, it's this huge teeming and absolutely fascinating underworld, which is there just to come out into the open. And we are just at the tip of the iceberg, I think, now. And they were all fighting for the same cause. The, the West Indies and the West African colonies were completely behind the mother country. And we've never given them that credit. We've never given them their dues and, and, and thanked them. And I guess this is where historians have a role to play, policymakers have a role to play, and, and the museum itself can disseminate this is information to the wider community. What the young people learned, they learned not so much about war itself, they learned about comradeship, they learned about um, team working, they learned about um, respect and recognition, and they were in awe of these people because they recognised that these men and women laid their lives down for them. I think Europeans have forgotten uh, the contribution by non-Europeans in the liberation of Europe. It's a story for all, you know, and all would be interested in that journey because we go places and we hear stories you know, as well of other people, of Asian, of Europeans, um, uh, of Eastern Europeans, and in that sense, uh, it's a, an exchange of, of histories, and we are learning and we are sharing. We live in a global world. We have a community in this country which is international. We are multicultural. However we take that word, we know what it means. And uh, that means that the curriculum that we have in school, whether it's literature or whether it's history or geography, needs to reflect 
that position that Britain, a relatively small offshore island in Europe, um, has played in the world. It has played a role above its weight and size. Um, but it's an imperial role, and it's not a very attractive history, but it needs to be taught. Service in the army opened a door, a door to new cultures, new languages. One man said to his officer, he said, I don't want to um, just learn Kiswahili. He said, I want to learn English because English opens a big door. Kiswahili opens a small door. If you had been a young man taken from your village and put into the army and away for five or six years, that was a major experience in your life. You didn't forget it. You might not want to talk about it, that's another matter. But many men were prepared to talk about it. And the experience of being recruited in that way or enlisting and serving overseas uh, was a dramatic one, a traumatic one for some. It introduced men to a kind of world that they had not even imagined, uh, a world of army lorries and white roads and uniform and other languages and other cultures, of huge ships on a sea which went up and down and made you seasick, of being carried on these huge ships long distances across the Indian Ocean or around the Cape or through the Mediterranean, then engaging with Big, big cities like Cairo or Bombay.